morning. We're going to start this morning with general questions, as usual, and we start with number one from Neil Findlay. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what recent contact it has had with women affected by transvaginal mesh implants. Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. In recent weeks, the Scottish Government has received uh, correspondence from a number of women, and as the member is aware, I have also recently met with the family of Mrs Baxter. Neil Findlay. Uh, it's my understanding that neither the Cabinet Secretary nor the First Minister has met with any of the Scottish mesh survivors. Uh, given this is the biggest healthcare scandal since thalidomide, and it's now affecting thousands of women, and now men too, will the Cabinet Secretary and the First Minister agree to meet with me and a delegation of Scottish mesh survivors? And given the stark findings of Professor Britton's report, will the Cabinet Secretary now instruct a new and truly independent report into the use of mesh in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'm grateful to Mr Finlay for that question. Uh, I am very content to accept his invitation to meet with Scottish mess survivors. I cannot, of course, speak for the First Minister's diary. Uh, in terms of the request for uh, a new inquiry, I should make the point in passing uh, that Professor Britton's report is primarily around how the government uh, organises, sets up and uh, oversees independent inquiries and therefore is not exclusively for me. However, uh, I, did, I have written to uh, John Wilkinson, who's Director of Devices at the MHRA, asking him to provide me with his evidence on which uh, that body uh, uh, has judged that MESH uh, products uh, are safe uh, for use in clinical practice and the CMO has written in similar terms uh, to the Chief Executive of the MHRA. When we receive that response, then we will be able to take a decision on other matters concerning the use of mesh in clinical practice across Scotland. Thank you. Question number two, John Finney. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how many vessels are in its marine and fisheries protection fleet. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. Marine Scotland into Compliance owns and operates three ships which provide a dedicated enforcement capacity. These are Jura, Herta and Minna, the last of which I visited in June this year in Oban. We've also got access to five rigid hulled inflatable boats on a daily basis to enhance the enforcement activity. John Finney. Um, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply. I wonder will the Cabinet Secretary provide an update to Parliament on the findings of the review which the Cabinet Secretary told me was ongoing in a letter dated April 16, 2018, and to which the Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy alluded to at the Econ Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee on the 6th of June 2018. But a challenge with the growing number of MPAs, Brexit, and um, I think there is a comparator when we, uh, it's the case that the Welsh Government, who are responsible for a considerably smaller marine area, have recently commissioned and are building five marine compliance vessels in Wales. Does the Cabinet Secretary really believe that it's right that Wales has a bigger fleet than Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Well, there are a number of things I could uh, take up there. First of all is that uh, the review that uh, both my colleague Fergus Ewing and myself uh, refer to is the constant review under which we uh, um, uh, keep issues such as this. Um, uh, I think the member will also recall uh, in my reply that we have two surveillance aircraft and also make regular use of unmanned aerial vehicles or drones, which adds considerably to our surveillance capacity. Um, with respect to the Welsh Government position, um, as I understand it, yes, indeed, the Welsh uh, are in the process of buying new boats, but they are considerably smaller than the boats which are in the Marine Scotland fleet uh, and are of a very different order uh, of uh, technology. So I don't think you can really compare like to like. Question number three, Bill Kidd. Uh, thank you, um, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to encourage local sourcing across public sector catering. Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing. Uh, officer, the Scottish Government is committed to encouraging and increasing local sourcing of food and drink across the public sector. Good progress has been made and we know that around 48% of food and drink sourced in the public sector is Scottish, a 41% increase since 2007. We believe that we can do more and we have put in place a range of measures and support to try and increase levels further. Bill Kidd. 
I uh, thank the Minister for that response and I welcome all movement towards local sourcing. Does the Minister agree that consumption shifts such as buying locally and seasonally are important in moving Scotland along a sustainable path? Cabinet Secretary. Well, yes, I do, and, and I would welcome the progress made by 11 local authorities in the Food for Life programme. Uh, and I, I, I very much believe that local procurement is something that's desirable uh, both for our schools, our hospitals, our prisons, and our whole public sector, but also for our food producers, our farmers, and suppliers. Uh, and we're doing uh, very many things in order to increase this yet further. Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, East Ayrshire Council have a great reputation uh, for sourcing food for schools local. I think somewhere in the region of over 75% of their food is sourced locally. Does the Cabinet Secretary recognise that the Scottish Government could use the Central Excel contract to ensure all of Scotland's school children get this very same opportunity to access quality locally produced food? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, yes, I, I'm very much aware of the good work that the Council does, and I know that, for example, Corrie Mains Farm in East Ayrshire supplies all the eggs to primary uh, schools. We are actually a wee bit ahead of the member, I'm very pleased to say, because we're already uh, doing what he's urged me to do today. <laughs> we, we have been for some time, uh, and I'm very pleased to say that uh, following the good work in 11 local authorities in Scotland, we are now expanding the programme to reach more schools by investing 400,000 for the next three years to target all 32 local authorities. So yeah, yeah. I'm sure the member will be delighted to hear that positive news. Yeah. Question four, Stuart Stevenson. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the Scottish Health Technologies Group's advice statement regarding the use of freestyle Libra flash glucose monitoring system. Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. We welcome the advice statement from the Scottish Health Technologies Group with regard to the flash glucose monitoring system. The advice statement has provided information on the clinical and cost effectiveness of this technology and supported NHS boards in determining the place of this technology for local use. Stuart Stevenson. Um, I welcome the decision of NHS Grampian in particular to act on this advice and wonder whether this statement has had any further impact on the uptake of this life-transforming technology by other health boards across Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'm grateful to Mr Stevenson for that supplementary question. It is important uh, to note that the device is used for self-monitoring of glucose levels via a sensor worn, but it is, as with many uh, other drugs and devices, not suitable for all patients and requires uh, to have that clinical judgment performed. Uh, Freestyle Libre Sensor is now available for a prescription in 13 out of the 14 uh, NHS board areas and NHS Highland uh, is currently working with the local diabetes service uh, to become the 14th board and I'm delighted about that. Mr Stevenson's point on uh, life transforming technologies is well made uh, and as our leading clinicians and clinical researchers work uh, with companies involved in terms of precision medicine and technologies, we are very mindful of the new demands that will come in terms of how we determine uh, what, what is clinically suitable, uh, either in drugs or in devices in, uh, such as this in terms of technologies, uh, and look to adapt our processes accordingly. David Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. As co-chair of the Cross-Party Group on Diabetes, I've had very positive feedback about Freestyle Libra, particularly the benefit of reducing the need for fre frequent finger prick blood tests and well maintained HbA1c levels, that's the blood glucose levels. Can the Cabinet Secretary please confirm that technology has been dispensed throughout Scotland according to the prescribed guidelines without caveats? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'm grateful to Mr Stewart uh, for that question and indeed for the work of the cross-party group uh, as he uh, chairs it. Um, my expectation is that the uh, device will be prescribed uh, according to the guidance. That is my absolute expectation from all the health boards uh, uh, concerned. So that is all of our territorial boards. And I would certainly want to know if that was not the case so that I could take action accordingly. Question number five, Alistair Allen. To ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made in securing work for the Arnish Fabrication Yard on the Isle of Lewis. Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. 
We continue to press developers to use Scottish contractors when building projects off our coastline and we encourage our supply chain to be as competitive as possible when bidding for these contracts. We have confidence that the new owners of BIFAB are doing everything possible to secure new contracts and restore employment to the yard at Arnish as well as Burn Island and Methil. Alistair Allen. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his reply and welcome that progress. Given their obvious interest in the matter, will the Cabinet Secretary undertake to keep representatives of the former workforce at Arnish updated directly, particularly around any news around new contracts? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I will commit uh, to do that. I have engaged with the uh, trade unions and there's good partnership working with the uh, local authority as well, uh, engaging with DF Barnes and BIFAB. And I think it's really important that we have a united Team Scotland approach to try and secure work for these yards. In addition to that, uh, I will arrange a briefing for uh, elected members who will be interested as well so that we can discuss further actions to secure work for the yards and ensure that people can return to that fruitful employment. Rudy Grant. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if the equipment in the yard is being kept up to date and maintained because it's owned by High, very expensive equipment and crucial to the, the yard's future? Cabinet Secretary. I don't have that detail to hand. I'm uh, happy to supply uh, further information to the member, but of course there has been substantial investment in terms uh, of the technology. The important thing right now is to secure those contracts. That work those benefits to the supply chain and that's absolutely what I'm focused on in working with the new owners. And of course there's a financial support package uh, as well uh, to try and preserve uh, the ability there to uh, secure work. We're working very hard to get those contracts and therefore every element that ensures that the yards are attractive including the infrastructure is absolutely vital and important. But the key critical issue right now is the ability to win contracts and on that I'm absolutely focused. Again, I'm happy to have a private briefing with interested elected members to see the efforts that we are undertaking to achieve that outcome. Thank you. Question six, Miles Briggs. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support it is providing to help grow the life sciences sector. Minister Ivan McKee. Life science is a growth sector for the Scottish economy. We're increasing innovation in the sector through the procurement of public services. And the Chief Science Office is investing £3 million from uh, 2018 to 2019 to support collaborative working between the NHS, industry and academia. Another recent investment includes £15 million contribution to the new medicines manufacturing and innovation centre, which will support the production of new medicines efficiently and safely. We're also working with Life Sciences Scotland, the industry leadership group, to ensure we have the right policy environment to support sectoral growth. Miles Briggs. Can the Minister confirm that the Scottish Government is not on course to meet its original target set in 2011 to double the turnover of the life science sector in Scotland to £6.2 billion by 2020 and that the Government has now extended that target to 2025? Does the Minister agree with me that Scotland's dynamic pharmaceutical sector, whose importance was demonstrated this week in the Fraser Valander report, is key to meeting that future target? target and what specific action will the Scottish Government take to improve data capturing capabilities and to link primary and secondary, secondary care data to allow more investment in clinical trials to actually realise the potential of Scotland's life sector, life sciences sector. Minister. Uh, the, the target for growth of the sector is to grow from 4 million to turnover to 8 million turnover um, and data will be coming out shortly that I We'll see, but I would believe we'd confirm that we're on target to meet that growth target. Um, in terms of what we're doing, with it, what the sector's doing, uh, the member will be aware that the First Minister recently opened the 54 million GSK pharmaceutical production centre in Montrose. Um, and in terms of what's happening with uh, in increasing uh, innovation within the sector, the Scottish Government continues to work with the industry leadership group, with the SMSIC and with IBIOIC to support innovation in the sector. In terms of what's happening specifically with the NHS, the Scottish Government continues to support the Health Innovation Partnerships and to work with the Scottish Health Innovations uh, Limited and the Golden Jubilee to increase the cooperation between the NHS and life sciences sector to grow innovation within the sector and increase its turnover and its exports. Uh, question 7 has not been lodged. Question 8, Alexander Burnett. Uh, can I thank the presiding officer and can I ask the Scottish Government 
uh, whether it will provide an update on what action it is taking to encourage doctors to relocate to rural practices. Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. Uh, our strategy to recruit and retain GPs underpins our commitment to recruit 800 additional GP, practicing GPs by 2027, backed by 7.5 million investment in uh, this financial year. The 2 million invested in a rural package includes the Scottish Rural Medicine Collaborative, Golden Hollows, and a relocation package. And we've also committed an additional £30 million by 2021 to support all GPs with premises related liabilities, reducing the risk to practices. And finally, I did launch the, our first graduate medicine programme, which will lead to an additional 330 medical graduates by 2028, primarily focused on remote and rural GP practices. Alexander Burnett. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? Now, I, as well as GPs in my constituency, are well aware of these programmes. However, they are simply not working for the rural community. So can I ask the government to look to review them to ensure that they can effectively encourage GPs to relocate to rural practices? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'm grateful to Mr Burnett for that additional question. I would uh, be very interested to see on what evidence he bases such a widespread and wide-ranging assertion. That is certainly not uh, the uh, experience that I have or indeed the evidence of our remote and rural working group or the rural collaborative uh, organisation, which of course are made up by, of GPs with experience in remote and rural areas. None of us said that this would be easy and none of us said that it was without challenge, but I have yet to hear of any additional constructive suggestions from uh, the member or any of the other opposition groups as to what we might do more of uh, to add to the successful work of the actions that I've outlined. Gail Ross. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide an update on what progress has been made by the Remote and Rural General Practice Working Group on how the new GP contract will work for rural areas? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'm grateful uh, to Ms Ross for that additional question. The Remote and Rural Working Group has commenced a programme of engagement with GPs, multidisciplinary clinicians and healthcare service providers in, to listen to their concerns, but also to hear from them what more they believe on the basis of their experience and their evidence we can do. One of the additional propositions that is uh, going to come our way is to include a dispensing practice training proposal. And this morning I had a very productive discussion with one of our rural colleges looking at how we can add to the multidisciplinary teams, not only in our acute setting, but also in primary care and in particular in those practices. Peter Chapman. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Devron Medical Practice in Banff will close shortly as it has been impossible to recruit a new GP. This critical shortage of GPs is due to workforce planning mismanagement and an underfund of 658 million to the GP service over the last four years. This will be the 11th practice to close in the past 11 years in Grampian and will leave nearly 6,300 patients without a GP practice. When will this SNP government act to solve this desperate crisis in the NHS? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, as I have made consistently clear, I do not underestimate the challenges. And as an MSP from a rural constituency myself, I'm well aware of the challenges of GPs, GP numbers and GP practices in those rural constituencies. But I have to say, I find it beyond uh, impertinence that uh, the member from those benches should argue with us about underfunding when they are part of a UK government that has shortchanged this NHS by failing to meet their promises, the promises they made in June, and a few short months later, they have undercut us yet again. Question number nine, Tom Arthur. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how it supports culture and tourism in Renfrewshire and East Renfrewshire. Cabinet Secretary Fiona uh, The Scottish Government continues to support cultural activities across Scotland with an increase of almost 10% culture funding this year despite UK Government cuts. Uh, Creative Scotland is the lead public body for supporting the arts and fund a range of cultural activity across Renfrewshire and East Renfrewshire. Through our funding of Visit Scotland, we continue to market the fantastic tourism assets there. And of course, the Youth Music Initiative and the Cashback for Creativity also supports culture in, for young people in communities there. Tom Arthur. 
thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. My constituency of Renfrewshire South, of course, is home to Eldersley, the birthplace of Sir William Wallace. Two of my SNP local government colleagues, Councillor Andy Steele and Councillor Jacqueline Cameron, have recently secured support from the Council to explore ways in which Eldersley can capitalise upon this status. Would the Cabinet Secretary be willing to meet with myself, Councillor Steele and Councillor Cameron to discuss how the Scottish Government can support this project? Uh, I understand the Renfrewshire Visitor Plan 2018 to 2021 uh, looks at marketing the region in lots of different ways, including promoting uh, its rich historical past, not least the Wallace connections to Aldersley. I'm more than happy to find out more about what that tourism offer is and to meet with the member to discuss that further. Thank you very much.